Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome both here at the Malaspina Theater and those joining us on Zoom. Thank you again for joining us today for this, the first event of VIU's Arts and Humanities Colloquium Series for Spring 2021-2022. My name is Dr. Tim Lewis. I am a professor in and chair of the VIU History Department, and it is my distinct pleasure to once again be serving as the MC for the Colloquium Series this year. Let me start by acknowledging that the that VIU's Nanaimo campus and the entire Nanaimo region is built on the traditional territory of the Sinemo First Nation. And as guests to this land, we need to always be grateful for the opportunity to live and learn, work and play here. And I also encourage everyone to seek out opportunities to further the process of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. For those of us, uh, for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, please make sure that your Zoom screen is on mute. A slash should be running through the microphone icon at the bottom left of your screen. Again, otherwise we'll be able to hear what's going on in your location, but I think everyone's kind of knows the drill by now, so thank you for that. And while we are truly grateful for all those who are joining us via Zoom, including today's presenter, Dr. Jennifer Griffiths, who is joining us from Italy. Uh, it is especially nice to once again uh, be in the lovely Malaspina Theater with members of a live audience. Yay. Yeah, <laughs> um, the members of the Arts and Humanities Colloquium Planning Committee, headed by our new chair, uh, English professor Dr. Theo Finnegan, would also like to extend our sincere thanks to the Dean of Arts and Humanities, Dr. Marnie Stanley, for her ongoing support of the work of the colloquium series, which again could not continue without the funding and moral support that her office provides. And Marnie has also done an amazing job of leading our faculty through these extraordinarily challenging COVID years. Her thoughtful and caring guidance is truly an example that should be emulated by all academic leaders. So when I was thinking about what form my traditional creative salute to Marnie should take, I was thinking about her kind of ideal leadership model and it somehow made, inspired me to think about the Gilbert and Sullivan classic, I am the very model of a modern major general, as I think Mar Marnie is the very model of a modern academic dean. So here goes. <clears throat> she is the very model of a modern academic dean. She's highly intellectual. So it's really not debatable. She's clearly highly capable, among the best there's ever been, a model modern academic dean. And we're so very grateful she keeps funding the colloquium, uh, even in these COVID times and without the sale of opium. <clears throat> Thus, it's truly inescapable. She's absolutely capable, among the best there's ever been, a model modern academic dean. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Uh, now I must make clear that uh, there has never been a time when Marnie has funded the colloquium series through the sale of opium, uh, but there are only so many words that rhyme with colloquium, so, so there you go. Now, speaking of Marnie, we have the great pleasure of having her here in the building today to say a few words to sort of introduce our series for the, uh, for the new year. So please welcome Dr. Marnie Stanley. I always like a good mosaic rhyme, so there you go. Um, welcome. When I first encountered the Italian futurists when I was an undergrad, I thought they were pretty exciting. Lots of color and dynamism in their art. Really challenging subject matter, like sound and smell and motion. And these are you know, visual artists in two dimensions mostly. I mean, there's good sculptures too, but to do those things. So you think about one of the most famous paintings, the dynamism of the dog on the leash with that wonderful daft hound with his little rolling feet. And they were a shouty bunch, which was very appealing. I even bought the, the Futurist cookbook when I was an undergrad. It wasn't a very good cookbook, so I'm not, uh, <laughs> not highly recommending it. They were always writing manifestos. I think they produced 50 in their first three years. 
And who doesn't like a good manifesto? I'm personally a big fan. They wanted to create the defining insult, the precise accusation. And they insulted a lot of inanimate objects that didn't, it didn't seem to matter that much. You know, they, they didn't like moonlight or sentimentality or monotony or the right angle or the nude or pasta. Because all of these things they associated with nostalgia and the past and the past was their enemy. I mean, this was a movement that started with a car accident where Marinetti swerved his car to avoid a bicycle and then he got all inspired to think about the bicycle as this low tech uninteresting object versus the car and speed. I think in those days you could probably go 20 miles an hour in a really hot car. But when you read the, the founding manifesto, the futurist manifesto that Marinetti wrote, Articles nine and 10 also assert his contempt for women. In number 10, for example, he lists feminism as one of the things that must be destroyed. And in number nine, which is the most well-known tenant of the original manifesto, he declared, quote, we intend to glorify war, the only hygiene of the world. Militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of anarchists, beautiful ideas worth dying for, and contempt for woman. In, unquote. In that tenant, the connection between futurism and fascism is also visible. And of course, that was a direction many of them took their ideological thought. Which is not to say that Marinetti didn't fall out with Mussolini fairly quickly. But today we are going to hear about how some women, in spite of those manifestos and in spite of the hostility, just got on with it anyway. Women such as Luisa Cassata and Benedetta Cappa. But also we're going to learn about how this art that was all about speaking directly to the people, museums, which they saw as kind of mausoleums of dead art were, were on their list of things to manifest about. These women also have almost faded from our sight. But as the guerrilla girls have taught us, <laughs> we should not be surprised when women disappear from art history. So please enjoy today's talk. And I'll return Tim to the microphone. Oh, thank you very much, Marnie. Uh, and again, thank you for all you do for not only the colloquium series, but uh, the whole faculty. Now, uh, please join me in welcoming to the stage, Dr. Theo Finnegan, uh, as he will be introducing you a little bit, little bit more to today's featured speaker, uh, former VIU uh, instructor in art history, Dr. Jennifer Griffiths. Theo. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, everyone, for coming um, to this, <clears throat> excuse me, presentation, both in person and online. I really appreciate it as chair of the committee. Uh, I'd also like to join Tim in beginning by thanking this new name, First Nation, uh, for giving us this opportunity to, to learn and, and, and share things here in the theater. Uh, Jennifer Griffiths was born in Ottawa, Ontario. She has a PhD in the history of art from Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania. She previously taught for the American University Iowa State University and the University of Georgia in Italy. She was a staff writer for the American Academy in Rome between 2013 and 2015. She's a specialist in Italian modern art and has published research and editorials in such venues as International Yearbook of Futurism Studies, Design Culture, uh, Women's Art Journal, Women's Studies Quarterly and Art Journal. She's presented papers internationally at the College Art Association, Columbia University, Oxford University and La Sapienza. And her first monograph, Mar Marisa Mori and the Futurists, a woman artist in the age of fascism, uh, is gonna be coming out next year with Bloomsbury. So I'd like you to join me please in welcoming uh, Jennifer beaming in from a very sunny looking Italy. And uh, thanks for joining us, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and my presentation. Um, but of course, let's see. How's that looking to everyone? Okay, everybody can see it. Um, <clears throat> but of course, before I get started, I too want to thank everyone involved in the colloquium uh, series. Thank you very much to Theo for the introduction, um, to Tim for the, uh, the ditty, uh, to Marnie for a, a, nice, a, a great segue. 
Um, and I do want to apologize for not being there in person because I would really love uh, to be there in person uh, in the Malaspina uh, theater. But as everybody can imagine, it's a bit more difficult to go uh, back and forth these days than it was previously. Um, <coughs> I also, before I, I launch into my materials, I want to put everybody sort of at ease or run you through um, the trajectory of my talk today. Um, so I have a kind of introductory slide here to give you a summary of what I'm going to talk about. Um, first of all, I'd like to give you in this talk the scholarly background to my project. Um, then, of course, I'm going to uh, move into giving you some biographies uh, and interesting details about a number of futurist women. I can't possibly cover them all, but I've chosen a selection today. Um, and then I'm going to uh, propose some ideas over the course of my research and investigation of this subject. I have some opinions about why it is that um, you might not have heard of them. So I'm gonna answer that or try uh, to propose some answers to that question. And then I'd like to talk uh, more specifically about Marisa Mori, uh, who is the subject of my forthcoming uh, monograph. Um, so that's what I'm going to cover today. I am mostly gonna be reading here uh, from papers as is the tradition, but I will try to keep it lively. Um, so like French cubism, uh, or Swiss Dada, Italian Futurism was an avant-garde movement that exploded at the beginning of the 20th century. Members of these cultural groups sought to revolutionary, revolutionize and revitalize the arenas of poetry, theater, and art. They thumbed their noses at tradition, as Marnie was saying, and they insisted that art must stop looking backward and start being of its time. Rather than lamenting the dramatic political, social, and technological changes that were reshaping European experience in the 20th century, these movements embraced them. So the Cubists rejected the 400 year old tradition of naturalistic illusion in art, insisting instead on the flatness of the canvas. Faced with the horrors of mechanized slaughter in World War I, the Dadaists refused to accept that mankind was civilized, choosing to make poetry and art that was based on irrationality instead. As some were decrying the destruction of the countryside by growing cities and railways or the mechanization of mankind, futurists made factories, cars, trains, and airplanes the subjects of their new art. They celebrated high speed, rapid change, and everything risky and unfamiliar. They initiated the ideal of arte vita, or an art engaged in every aspect of life. Art as life and life as art, an idea that we almost take for granted today. Most university courses and textbooks on modern art still read like a canonical list of artistic father figures. Monet, Van Gogh, Picasso, Kandinsky, and in the case of futurism, Umberto Boccioni. Women artists have repeatedly been written out of conventional museum accounts and histories, despite the fact that issues of gender were often of primary interest to these groups. What we know now is that women contributed to the avant-garde in surprising numbers, embracing lives that were full of art, creativity, experimentation, and adventure. Yet as research into women of some of these other avant-garde movements has flourished over the past 30 years, interest in women futurists has mostly floundered. Some have argued that this might be because people have been put off by some of the abhorrent rhetoric towards women that are in those futurist manifestos. It is still widely believed that this was a misogynist man's movement. 
the fact that the founder of the movement and its first adherents were all men is nothing unique to futurism. This was likewise the case for Cubism and for Dada. This famous photograph of 1912 shows the original signatories of the Futurist Manifesto, Luigi Russolo, Carlo Carrà, F.T. Marinetti, Umberto Boccioni, and Gino Severini on the far right, looking very boring and bourgeois. Yet they had recently issued a manifesto that exclaimed the beauty of speed, called for the destruction of museums and libraries, and poo-pooed every form of tradition. Their artistic revolution hadn't yet spilled into fashion, but it would. Among the most infamous and offensive lines of their founding and manifesto was, of course, the statement, we will glorify war, the world's only hygiene, militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of freedom bringers, beautiful ideas worth dying for, and scorn for woman. This is a troubling line because it links masculine anger and aggression with love of country and hatred of women. Something that perhaps sets off alarm bells for us today. Yet things are more complicated than they seem. The author of the manifesto and the founder of the movement, F.T. Marinetti, Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, called himself the caffeine of Europe. And his aim here was to rile up his audience as much as possible. He knew he would anger a lot of people with this statement. Every media specialist today knows that negativity sells. Marinetti was a brilliant promotional pioneer and he rightly calculated that if people got angry at him, they would remember his movement. Perhaps his misogynist rhetoric was too effective because we continue to take him at his word a century later. I was born in the year that a curator and a critic named Lea Vergine mounted a major Italian exhibition called L'altra metà dell'avanguardia, the other half of the avant-garde. It was 1980. It was the first to shine a light on 100 forgotten avant-garde women artists, many of them futurists, one of whom became the focus of my study. Lea Vergine died last year in hospital from complications of coronavirus. But her truly groundbreaking exhibition prompted the first wave of research into women artists and writers of the Italian avant-garde. Two years later, Claudia Salaris published an important study called Le Futuriste, Women and Literature of the Avant-Garde. Two years, uh, sorry, um, uh, recuperating information about these women. That's the one I'm showing you on the right, the cover I'm showing you on the right there. She was able to interview some of these uh, women personally prior to their deaths. And now 40 years later, she has published a new book on the same topic. And in her introduction to the book, she stresses that a radical or avant-garde life was particularly difficult in Italy, where women felt the weight of traditional culture and morality. So my own forthcoming book will be a contribution to this herstory, if you will, of art, one that aims to broaden our understanding of Italian futurism and women's relationship to the avant-garde. Marisa Mori and the Futurists, a woman artist in an age of fascism, will be the first English monograph on Mori and one of very few in-depth examinations of any woman futurist. In it, I analyze her contributions in the context of history, and I offer an in-depth analysis of her art through the lens of feminist theory, drawing on what is now a 50-year-old tradition of feminist methodology in the history of art. So I'd just like to back up and give you a little background to that methodology and how it emerged. <coughs> 
1949, of course, Simone de Beauvoir published The Second Sex, challenging the myth of male superiority and setting in motion what has come to be called second wave feminism. This was a feminism that looked beyond the vote um, to think about a broader range of questions. And de Beauvoir outlined the many challenges that had always stood in the way of women's accomplishments, famously argued, arguing that one is not born a genius, one becomes a genius. And the feminine situation has, up to the present, rendered this becoming practically impossible. Exactly 50 years ago, in 1971, Linda Nochlin authored an essay called why have there been no great women artists? Which became something of a founding and manifesto for feminist art history. In her essay, she echoed Simone de Beauvoir, pointing out the many social circumstances that had long disadvantaged women in the art world. She conceded that there have been no great women artists, writing, there are no women equivalents for Michelangelo although there have been many interesting and very good ones who remain insufficiently investigated or appreciated. So whether or not we agree with this concession by Nochlin depends a lot on how we view greatness. But her essay made two things very clear. Firstly, that one major task of a feminist art history was going to be the rediscovery of its forgotten female protagonists. And secondly, that a feminist art history would have to interrogate assumptions about genius and greatness because these determinations had been excluding a whole group of fascinating figures from our histories. Sorry. Okay, so I discovered the existence of futurist women as an intern at the Peggy Guggenheim collection in Venice. Monitoring the galleries meant standing in front of the pictures for many hours, which was not always fun. But while standing in front of Umberto Boccioni's iconic image of his mother, Materia of 1912, I was deeply struck by what, by, by what I perceived to be the artist's profound respect for this woman in a representation of her almost godlike power. I saw reverence rather than scorn in this image and I wanted to know more. <clears throat> what I gradually discovered was that Boccioni and Marinetti had complex and often contradictory things to say about women. In fact, Marinetti expressed an opinion that was closely in line with the ideas later encapsulated by Simone de Beauvoir and Linda Nochlin. At the same time as he was writing the manifesto, he wrote elsewhere that, quote, if the body and spirit of woman were to experience an identical education to that received by the body and spirit of man, then perhaps it would be possible to speak about equality of the sexes. In real terms, he was also someone who offered women those equal opportunities, advocating on their behalf, inviting them to exhibit, and becoming a patron of their work. The indisputably misogynist rhetoric of early futurism notwithstanding, it opposed tradition, rejected many cultural stereotypes about women, criticized the delimiting institutions of marriage, and questioned bourgeois family values, which made it appeal to a group of women who saw it as potentially liberating. Nevertheless, it is quite unlikely that you have ever heard of Valentine de Saint-Point, Rosa Rosa, Regina Cassolo Bracchi, Adriana Bisifabri, Adele Gloria, Fides Testi, Ruzena Zarkova, Frances Simpson Stevens, Alma Fidora, Benedetta K. Marinetti, Barbara Olga Biglieri Scurto, or 
Marisa Mori, to name but a few. So today, I'd like to introduce a handful of them. Valentine de saint point was the first woman to be drawn into Marinetti's energetic circle. She was a Franco-Italian illustrator, early pioneer of avant-garde performance, and the author of two controversial futurist manifestos. The Manifesto of uh, the Futurist Woman and the Manifesto of Lust. In the Manifesto of the Futurist Woman, she responded to Marinetti's scorn by countering that all of humanity was mediocre and deserving of scorn. But she took up Marinetti's violent rhetoric, calling on women to reclaim their potential for cruelty and remembering the precedent of mythic warrior heroines like the Amazons, Joan of Arc, or Charlotte Corday. In the Manifesto of Lust, she advocated for free love, celebrated female eroticism, and defended homosexuality. Her manifestos were circulated in French, Italian, Portuguese, German, and Russian. She chose to remain on the margins of futurism, and in the 1920s, she moved to Egypt and converted to Islam. Artist and poet Mina Loy <clears throat> penned her own satirical feminist manifesto in 1914, which mocked futurist misogyny. In it, she said, leave off looking to men to find out who you are not. Seek within yourselves to find out who you are. Loy and her American friend and roommate, Frances Simpson Stevens, encountered the futurists in Florence, where they were part of a cultural circle that included Mabel Dodge, and Gertrude Stein. With Russian painters, Olga Rodzanova and Alexandra Exter, they were the first women among the first, they were the first women and among the first international artists to exhibit with the futurists at the first free international exhibition of futurist art at the Sprovieri Gallery in Rome in 1914. Simpson Stevens was the only American present at this show, exhibiting eight paintings. <clears throat> Unfortunately, these types of cross-cultural collaborations were snuffed out with the outbreak of World War I. Mina Loy later immigrated to New York, where she became better known as a poet. And on the left, I'm showing you a cover of her lost lunar Baedeker, a collection of poems. Simpson Stevens, on the other hand, married a Russian prince and traveled to Japan and China before returning to America in 1920. Adriana Bizi Fabri was a painter, <clears throat> illustrator, and caricaturist who earned the admiration of Italian artists and critics for her ironic and satirical images. She was doubtless involved in futurism by her better known cousin, Umberto Boccioni. Unable to apply to the Academy of Art, she was entirely self-taught. She and another woman artist, Alma Fidora, established or ex excuse me exhibited at the first exhibition of the nuove tendenze or the new tendencies group which was a rather conservative milanese branch of futurism headed by a modernist architect antonio santelia she became a political cartoonist for the milanese periodical il popolo d'italia the people of italy and from uh, that was from its first issue in 1915 signing with the gender neutral name adri and, address, and then dressing in men's clothing when she was visiting its offices to disguise the fact that she was in fact the only female political cartoonist in Italy at this time. In a letter to her future husband, she wrote, I don't want to be a woman. When these chains break, I will fly high. She died of tuberculosis at age 37 in 1918. Rosa Rosa, who was born Edith von Heinau in Vienna, experimented across literary and visual media, 
<coughs> becoming a key voice in early futurist debates about what was then called la questione della donna, or the woman question, la querelle la femme in French, uh, within a periodical called Italia Futurista, or Futurist Italy, during World War I. In 1917, she insisted that it would be impossible after the war for women to return to their previously limited social status. She wrote, at this moment, millions of women have replaced men in jobs which, they, which it was previously thought that only men could do. <coughs> women are useful now. The field to which they are restricted has in all respects been enlarged and will never become as narrow as it was before. Women, she said, were starting to take possession of a free consciousness. One major scholar has argued that she was the only futurist woman to demonstrate a consistently feminist perspective throughout her work. <coughs> Ruzena Zatkova was a pioneer of abstract and kinetic art and the only Czech futurist. Her most celebrated works are a mixed media sculpture entitled Ram, which you see here, uh, subtitled Sensibility, Noises, and Rhythmic Forces of a Pile Driver of 1916, which is now lost, and her portrait of Marinetti, Solar Light, Luce Solare. As both a painter and sculptor, she was equally influenced by the Russian and Italian avant-garde. She was close friends with the Russian painters Mikhail Larionov and Natalia Goncharova. And after marrying a Russian diplomat in 1910, she moved to Rome, where she became a close friend and associate of Giacomo Balla and Enrico Prampolini, leading lights of futurist art and design in the 1920s. Discovering abstract art, she would write to her sister, Never in my life have I had such a powerful feeling of creating and freedom, such joy and such passion. She died of tuberculosis in a Swiss clinic in 1923, age 38, while arranging her first solo exhibition in her home city of Prague. In its early years, futurism had been based in Milan. But following World War I, it was Giacomo Balla's studio in Rome that became its new epicenter. Benedetta Cappa was one of his students, and in Balla's studio, she befriended Zatkova and met F.T. Marinetti. After a long relationship with the much older founder of the movement, she became his wife in 1926. During her career, she published three novels, participated in five Venice Biennales, attended the first Futurist Congress of 1924, and executed a major public works project for the fascist regime in 1934, with a series of five murals that I'm showing you here called Syntheses of Communication. Marinetti promoted his wife's work and collaborated with her on several theatrical projects. He described her as, quote, my equal and not my disciple. Some have seen in her artwork a pioneering kind of essentialist feminist abstraction. So my book is about Marisa Mori, who trained with a magic realist painter, sometimes thought of as a neo-Renaissance painter named Felice Casorati in the city of Turin in the north of Italy, before meeting the futurists in the summer of 1931. She was the only female contributor to the Futurist Cookbook with a recipe entitled Italian Breasts in the Sun, a dish in which almond paste and strawberries are molded into breasts on a tray that are sprinkled with hot pepper. She had a solo show at Anton Giulio Bragaglia's Roman Gallery in 1934. And in the same year, she accepted Marinetti's aviation challenge to fly in an early acrobatic biplane over the Italian capital, receiving his seal of approval as a bona fide aeropitrice or female aeropainter. 
arrow painting was a subgenre of futurism during the 1930s that was inspired by the revolutionary new technology of the airplane. Aviation was, of course, still a very dangerous enterprise, and Mori was one of four futurist women who braved these dangers to inspire her art. One of the others, Barbara Olga Billeris Hurto, was in fact a licensed pilot. Mori exhibited internationally with the futurists until 1940. Unlike many of her peers, she severed her ties to futurism because its leadership continued to support the regime even after the passage of the race laws in 1938. This was not merely lip service on her part. During the Nazi occupation of Florence and of Italy more widely, she gave shelter and aid to a family of Jewish intellectuals from Turin called the Levi Montalcinis, which included her friend and fellow painter, Paola Levi Montalcini, whose twin sister, Rita Levi Montalcini, would later win a Nobel Prize for her work as a neurobiologist, and their brother, the architect Gino Levi Montalcini. After the war, Mori would abandon the avant-garde language and return to more traditional painting. So women clearly had a presence within futurism from 1912, three years after its founding, until Marinetti's death and the end of the movement. So why then do we know so little about them? And why do they still seem marginal to our understanding of this movement? It was surprising to me that as recently as 2016, a major scholar of the avant-garde named Hal Foster identified misogyny and phallocentrism as being fundamental cornerstones of Marinetti's platform and asserted the absence of women, quote unquote, in futurism. So too did curators of the 2020 International Retrospective on Cubo Futurist Natalia Goncharova, which went to the Palazzo Strozzi in Florence, as well as the Tate Modern in London. Curators claimed that futurism, quote unquote, admitted no women. These kinds of erroneous assertions in the international context suggest that the scholarship done by Lea Vergine and Claudia Salaris 40 years ago has had little impact outside of Italy. They suggest that women continue to remain peripheral to our understanding. I believe that the invisibility of these women is part of a vicious cycle. Women artists have been and continue to be less celebrated than their male counterparts. Therefore, their work has been and continues to be neglected by official archives and museums. As time passes, their papers, letters, and works are gradually thrown away, lost, dispersed, or destroyed. Missing evidence cannot be recovered. So the dearth of surviving material grows over time. Since we don't have much to go on, we later make assumptions based on this lack of evidence. We assume these women didn't exist or that their work must not have been worth preserving in the first place. The artworks and papers of futurist women do indeed seem to have suffered disproportionately from the fates. Many of the material objects that would attest to their activities are lost. For example, Rosa Rosa made large scale paintings and sculptures, but none of these appear to be extant and only her illustrations survive. A large part of Alma Fidora's production and archive was destroyed by aerial bombings of Milan in 1940. 
all of the paintings exhibited by both Francis Simpson Stevens and Mina Loy at the Free International Futurist Exhibition in 1914 were scattered and lost with the outbreak of war. Only one painting by Simpson Stevens survives in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and it is not generally on display. She died in a residential care home in California in 1976. We know nothing about her life after 1928, and it appears that none of her personal belongings survived. Zatkova completed a large number of experimental abstract drawings and a series of paintings entitled States of Mind that were inspired by Umberto Boccioni's ideas. Little is known about this cycle because the works have not been located. The artist saw them as some of her best work, but her sister and husband did not feel the same, describing them as very primitive and, quote, having little to do with art. So after her premature death, they apparently discarded a large number of her studies and drawings, some of which were for this series. Another challenge is that few major museums own works of art by these women, nor have they decided to begin acquiring them. So only a handful of works by futurist women are in public collections. Extant works of art tend to be widely dispersed in private collections where they cannot easily become part of the public discourse either. So even as researchers amass more biographical information about these women, this lack of access to their works of art makes it difficult to deepen our study and analysis. Imagine we had no paintings by Picasso and we only had his drawings. In 2011, Elena Pomatslova made a large effort to recover the story of Rudzina Zatkova for a Prague exhibition. And she described the difficulties of her enterprise as, quote, encompassing nearly the whole world because so many of the artist's papers and works were scattered across continents. Thankfully, Adriana Bizi Fabri's archive is intact. It was ignored for the better part of a century, um, but it became the focus of a retrospective on the artist in 2019, a very exciting one. Benedetta Cappa Marinetti's links to the founder of the movement also helped to raise her profile. And she has several paintings in major museums. Uh, and her papers are part of the Marinetti archive at the Getty Institute in Los Angeles. Her mural series that I showed you, Synthesi delle Comunicazioni, or Synthesis of Communication, uh, also became a major highlight of the New York Guggenheim's big 2014 Futurism exhibition. So Mori designed a series of futurist-inspired ceramics, I know, uh, from letters, but all of these have been lost. During the course of my research, I rediscovered the location of two large-scale paintings, but the whereabouts of several other works are still unknown. Many are dispersed across continents in multiple private collections, and I certainly did not have the resources to track them all down. In 2015, the artist's son donated a self-portrait to the Uffizi Gallery, and this is so far her only picture in a public collection but it has never been displayed. Over the course of the past six years, I have witnessed the slow attrition of Mori's archive. Some photographs, letters, and drawings have been sold to private collectors. Others have simply disappeared. This year, I have been begun working with the family to facilitate their donation of the Mori papers to the Archivio del Novecento, uh, the archive of um, the 20th century at the Museo d'Arte Rovereto e Trento, so um, the Museum of Art in the city of Rovereto, uh, which is a very important holding of the private papers of numerous members of the Italian avant-garde. So a general scarcity of source material on these women and the low profile of that material, which has survived, has fed into several assumptions or misconceptions. 
that they simply never existed, that they were not committed futurists, that they must have been marginal figures, or that the work they made must have been second rate. When I began studying futurist women for my doctoral dissertation, I consulted a professor of modern and contemporary art and criticism, one of the most important futurist specialists in the world. And she told me, you quote, will do no favors to other women artists by studying these inferior ones. A few, later years, a few years later, after I had published uh, my first article on Mori, I was interviewed for a fellowship by a New York curator who told me that Mori was simply inferior to her male peers. I am stubborn and opinionated. So perhaps this conversation solidified my determination to know more. How could all women futurists be tarred with the brush of inferiority? How could anyone fairly judge Moni's works, which were, and mostly still are, entirely in private hands across three continents? Furthermore, such sentiments as these suggested that there was no social or historical value to the pictures in question. And more worryingly still, Accusations of inferiority like this have plagued women artists throughout the centuries, helping to rationalize their exclusion from the canon and ensuring the continued dearth of serious critical attention. As our critic and feminist activist Lucy Lippard once argued, quote, the notion of quality has been the most effective bludgeon on the side of homogeneity in the modernist and postmodernist periods. Time and again, artists of color and women determined to revise the notion of quality into something more open, with more integrity, have been fended off from the mainstream stronghold by this garlic and cross strategy. Subjective determinations about quality, mastery, or aura are often self-interested or driven by political and economic concerns that lie outside the work of art itself. In my book, I have tried to consider Mori's artworks as historic documents embedded in the cultural meaning uh, that they tell us, excuse me, embedded in cultural meaning that tell us something about the person who made them, yes, but certainly tell us about the conditions in which they did so. <laughs> so let me tell you more about my project and my studies on Mori. If you cross the Ponte Vecchio in Florence and you walk past the Pitti Palace beyond the perimeter of the medieval wall, you will eventually emerge into a modern urban cityscape down the Via Senese and tucked away, unseen behind a bright green gate, stands a 20th century villa surrounded by gardens where Marisa Mori spent 45 years living and painting. After her death, her only son, Franco Mori, and his wife, Gina, who I show you here on the left, continued to live in the house with their two daughters. During her lifetime, the artist refused to hang a single painting but her family subsequently decorated the walls of nearly every room with her work. Franco and Gina were already nonogenarians when I met them. They attended medical school together during the fascist era. They were arrested and Franco was severely beaten for circulating resistance materials during the war. They had been married for more than 70 years when Franco died in December of 2019. On my first visit to their home, they showed me to a small damp basement room where at least a hundred works were stacked. Many of them were growing mold. I felt there was a timeliness to my arrival. Remarkably, the family still possessed a large archive of the artist's letters, notes, diaries, clippings, publications, photographs, drawings, dedicated books, and of course, works of art. 
So here was the vital resource that enabled me to study Māori in greater depth. When I wrote my doctoral dissertation on women futurists, Māori's work piqued my interest because her futurist paintings looked so different. Many of her pictures, even those with ostensibly fascist themes, seemed to be underwritten with irony. Her soft contours and opaque figural compositions seemed to blend the mysterious softness of magic realism with the colorful energy of futurism, two styles that are often thought of as opposite artistic tendencies. She was interesting to me with respect to her marginality and liminality. She was also the only woman futurist to depict the female nude. The feminist art critic, Lisa Tickner, once asserted that women artists have historically had two options with respect to representing the female body. Either to ignore it as muddled or dangerous for the production of clear statements, or to take the heritage and work with it, attack it, reverse it, expose and use it. In my book, I argue that Mori took this latter approach, creating several works that seem to be frank, sometimes ironic self-reflections on the experience of being a woman. The peak years of her personal and professional life were bracketed by Mussolini's dramatic rise and fall. His 20 year premiership referred to as the Ventenio, uh, was marked by increasing restrictions on women's personal lives and professional opportunities. Fascism's seizure of power was marked by a pronounced attempt at regulating the private sphere. Its policies included a sustained demographic campaign begun in 1927 that targeted women's bodies, promoted motherhood as a duty to the state, and attempted to limit women in the workplace. Mussolini stated his opinion quite unequivocally. A woman must obey. My opinion of her part in the state is in opposition to every feminism. In politics, she must not count. Launching the demographic campaign, what was called the battle for births, he asserted, war is to man what maternity is to woman. If man was a machine of destruction, then woman would be a machine for reproduction, components in a kind of soulless state engine. When in 1934, Mussolini read an advertisement for women members to join the local flying club in Bologna, he sent an immediate telegram to the mayor instructing him to retract this invitation and instead bar women from attending. He wrote in that letter, quote, the most fascist thing Italian women can do is to pilot many children. Flying, on the other hand, is a serious affair that must be left to men. The perceived power of flight, both real and symbolic, was for Mussolini something that belonged to men. So during these restrictive decades, Mori separated from her husband and left her only son in the care of her mother to devote herself to becoming a professional artist. She exhibited her work internationally with the futurists, traveled widely with them, and went up in an acrobatic biplane. She illustrates how in real terms, Attempts by the right-wing government to stymie women's personal and professional aspirations failed, just as Rosa Rosa predicted that they would. Nevertheless, propaganda and policy necessarily impact the kinds of choices women can make and their strategies for success. So I'd like to show you three paintings by Marisa Mori to give you a sense of her, her work. Possession <clears throat> was painted during a period when the artist was attempting to reconcile with her estranged husband. And it seems to reflect on her anxieties about male aggression and domination. 
A nude female figure is clasped in the arms of a darkly dressed male whose hands look like claws to ensnare her and whose eyes emit beams of light that penetrate through her form, looking like jail bars. The two figures are fused at the head in an embrace that conveys a sense of captivity rather than intimacy. Mori lived in a society where both legally and spiritually, a married woman was expected to obey her husband. Speaking publicly in 1948, she expressed the opinion that marriage was irreconcilable with the life of an artist. A married woman artist, she said, is forced, quote, to split herself between artist and wife insofar as the two have opposing and contradictory aims. The former is an active being that wants to dominate and the latter is a passive one who must submit to subjugation. In her title here, she underscored the sense of violent ownership that may have colored her personal experience. Sleeping Aviatrix is a painting inspired by the idea of flight. So Mori had not yet flown herself. The rough contours of a fleshy pink female nude are intertwined with the fragmented and colorful forms of a propeller wing and cockpit. Behind the composite of human and machine forms is a bed of pale blue and a touch of green that imply the earth and sky. Modi's figure is apparently in command of a modern machine, but her eyes are closed and she relinquishes control in a state of sleep. The figure therefore maneuvers in a virtual airplane through a dreamscape in the land of Morpheus, where a flying machine becomes a metaphor for the journey of the mind, a symbol of inner freedom. Mori has pictured a modern woman, a machine woman, who occupies uh, the in-between spaces, the literal and figurative interstice between earth and sky, body and spirit, vision and dream. At the peaceful helm only of her own fantasies, she deflates the futurist or fascist martial image of a heroic masculine aviator who sees and conquers all he surveys. The physical ecstasy of maternity is perhaps Mori's most important work. Striking and bold in its subject matter, it represents a reclining and exposed woman in the grip of childbirth. There is no other avant-garde painting like it. If the futurists often celebrated masculinity, machines, and militarism, then here is a visual image that counters with a dramatic celebration of the female body and its creative power. This is a different kind of affirmative action and violence. As in Sleeping Aviatrix, she creates a merger of woman and machine, hinting at the presence of an airplane via certain contours and lines. But the power of the machine is overwhelmed and overwritten by the material power of an organic body. History matters. The past is always present because ideas change very slowly. Human biases are woven into the telling of history and those biases have shaped our understanding of ourselves for hundreds of years. Well into the 20th century, European scientists were actively measuring and weighing human brains, seeking to find evidence for their conviction that there was a hierarchy of intelligence with white males at the apex. Nearly every day, we witness contemporary events that remind us how sexism and racism are still very much with us in the 21st century. If history tells us who we are, then we clearly need more histories that reflect the true variety of our humanity. Sexism is still a problem for the art world. A collaborative study by Charlotte Burns and Julia Halperin in 2019 surveyed 26 major art museums and institutions in the United States and looked at the activities of the global art market. In an article 
uh, called Women's Place in the Art World, Why Recent Advancements for Female Artists are Largely an Illusion. They presented findings that suggest that despite increased public lip service to diversity, not much has been changing. Over the past decade, only 11% of their acquisitions and 14% of their exhibitions were of work by female artists. Women artists constituted only 2% of worldwide auction sales. These numbers seem to suggest that our institutions still think men are naturally worthier or that art is alien to the mind of women. Only by examining the accomplishments of women artists and telling their stories can we hope over time to displace these old myths. History is his story if it's written as the rise and fall of epic cultural geniuses and political heroes. The history of art has almost always been told this way as a story of the absolute artist, an iconoclastic male genius whose greatness was somehow predestined, innate and inevitable. Women artists will always look peripheral to this kind of history. Since Linda Nochlin's famous concession that there have been no great women artists, many feminist art historians have disagreed, researching and arguing for the greatness or the genius of figures like Artemisia Gentileschi, Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, and Paula Morrison Becker. The primary aim of my book is to preserve the disappearing legacy of a marginalized member of the futurist avant-garde. But I do not argue that she was a great woman artist, nor that she was an unsung genius. I have found it far more powerful to argue that she was a woman like many others of her time, struggling to understand herself in relation to traditional expectations and modern opportunities. I argue that her importance lies not in her position above, ahead, or beyond the culture of her time, but in the ways that she was inextricably bound to it, shaped by it, and sometimes limited by it. And I see in her story and in her struggles lessons for us in our own time. Thank you very, very much for listening.